There are tons of YouTube settings that can make or break a video. So here's 16 of them and how to fix them so you get more views. Make sure you stick around until the end because there's a huge update to a setting you're all desperate to get your hands on. So in your YouTube studio, go to settings and then upload defaults and find visibility. The last thing you want to do is set this to public. You need to give YouTube time to process a video up to its highest quality as well as do its copyright checks. My general recommendation is that you give yourself a minimum of a two hour window from upload to publishing. Obviously it's a bit different if your video is very time sensitive, upload it in private, prepare it and then publish it as soon as you can. All right, we're going to move from upload defaults to look at individual settings for videos. A lot of these can be set at the upload default level so they affect all videos, but some will need to be treated individually like this brand new setting, Altered Content. If you're using AI to generate any part of a video, whether it be visuals or audio, you definitely need to read this question, but you don't necessarily need to answer yes all of the time. YouTube support have supplied tons of examples on what you need to do, and we've made some dedicated videos on the subject, so make sure to check them out. It's all linked below. Put simply, treat the question like this. If your AI generated content may mislead a viewer into thinking a famous person or a famous location is real when it isn't, the answer is probably yes. Now the impact of doing this is quite small. In most cases, all it will do is add this message to the video description. In some cases, YouTube may deem it necessary to add this label to the actual video as it's plain, but YouTube says that this shouldn't impact the discovery of the content or monetization. However, this does all hinge on you answering the altered content question correctly. If you don't, there are penalties, demonetization, removal of the content, possibly worse. The next setting is pretty much a legal requirement. You've got to declare whether or not the video is exclusively made for kids. Now, in many cases, there will be audience overlap, which means that the content isn't solely made for kids, such as the Marvel franchise. I'm interested in it and I'm clearly not a child. On the other hand, something like Coco Melon Nursery Rhymes is definitely aimed solely at children and is rightly labeled as such. So the question is this, if the video would only be enjoyed by children under the age of 13, then it is made for kids. Now there are some pretty big implications of making content exclusively for children, including all of this stuff, no comments, cars, end screens, super chats, the list goes on. But the penalties for not being truthful with this question are pretty dire. In most cases, YouTube will just override your answer and set the video as made for kids, but they could take further action. And in extreme cases, the FTC could get involved it's a big fine, unlikely, but it's not worth the risk, right? One of the less well-known settings now, and that's whether or not to notify your subscribers when a video first goes public. It is very rare that you'd want to turn this off as naturally you want your videos to have the widest distribution as possible. But there may be rare circumstances, such as when you upload a dedicated channel trailer or when you definitely know that this video is not gonna resonate with your core audience that you wanna turn this setting off. Ultimately, what you're trying to avoid here is bad viewing signals being sent to the YouTube algorithm about your video early on in its life. Now, this is a setting I use all of the time. It's found under visibility and it gives you the option to schedule your video to go public at a date and time in the future. You're probably not aware of this, but we do schedule our videos to go public every Monday and Friday at exactly the same time to create a subconscious watching habit within our audience. And this is backed up by data from vidIQ's best time to post tool, but also from data found in the analytics section of the YouTube studio. This panel will show you when your viewers are on YouTube. So obviously you want to target the release of your content around the same time. Now, unfortunately for many small channels, this data might not be available but I do have one more trick I wanna show you. You can see from the real-time views in your analytics how your audience comes and goes. In this example, it is clear that there is a surge of views every day around about late afternoon. So we publish videos as that surge starts to rise in the early afternoon. So the tip here is to publish your videos two or three hours before the peak of your audience on YouTube, unless the video is time sensitive, publish it as quick as you can. Now, YouTube do state that the published time of the video does not impact its long-term performance, but at the same time, you don't wanna publish your videos when none of your viewers are on YouTube, right? It just doesn't make any sense. And as a bonus tip, try publishing your videos not at the top of the hour, say 1.15 or 6.45. 
that means your notifications are not competing with everybody else's. Another YouTube setting that has more of a legal nature to it is the pay promotion one. If you've been paid to talk about a specific product or service in one of your videos, then for your own integrity and credibility, you want to be open and transparent about it, right? This is the only impact on your video, a small label in the top left hand corner of a screen that will disappear after a few seconds. Not much more to add here from a creator point of view, other than in some jurisdictions, it is a legal requirement to do this, so make sure you're honest, but from a viewer's point of view, this is interesting. You can almost always tell when there's a pay promotion segment on a video because the most replayed part of a video will have this spike showing the pay promotion viewers skipped. I wonder if the advertisers ever look at this. Okie dokie, we're going to look at the automatic chapter setting next, but only to advise you not to use it. Now, don't get me wrong. Video chapters can be extremely helpful for longer videos, especially educational ones, but automatic chapters can sometimes spoil the video and they're not terribly accurate either. So here's a crash course in how to manually create chapters. In the description, write a timestamp like this, zero colon zero zero. Then give it a title. Next, do exactly the same thing with a new timestamp and that will create another chapter and so on and so on. Now I do this for every video and I'll tell you why. It kind of acts like a final proofread of the video once it's been uploaded to YouTube. Check that everything's right before I press publish. Adding video chapters will have an unavoidable impact on audience retention, which you can check in the analytics of the video. But ultimately, chapters are designed to help viewers. And if they're happy, YouTube is happy. All right then, deep breath, everybody. Let's talk about YouTube categories because somebody's got to. You would think categories might be quite important, especially when YouTube says this will help viewers find videos more easily. But where on earth is this random assortment of categories implemented that helps the discovery of content? The search filters don't offer these options and the topic chips found dotted around YouTube are far more granular, specific and useful. Now I spent a good, no, precious 15 minutes of my own time trawling through the YouTube support pages, looking for any mention of YouTube categories and found nothing. So this is a pretty bold statement for YouTube to make without really backing it up. However, a YouTube employee recently did say this. When we have absolutely no behavioral data, we're going to probably rely more on the metadata, the data that we have in terms of the title, and the description. So I don't know, maybe it is useful, maybe it isn't. My best guess is that video categories is a legacy of YouTube's old discovery features and tools, much like video tags. Yeah, we'll get back to them. So the advice here is pretty simple. Set the video category as close to what you think it should be for your video and don't sweat it. For the gaming category, it does let you search for the specific game you're covering and it will appear in the description of the video. But let's be crystal clear about this. The success or failure of a video is not going to be solely determined by its category. All right, we've got two settings now, but I've got to confess, I don't entirely know what they do. Automatic places and automatic concepts. And I say this because despite how they're described, I haven't seen these out in the wild on YouTube. Automatic places talks about highlighting key places in a carousel in the description of your video. Gotta confess, I myself have never witnessed this feature on YouTube. It could be useful for travel channels, but at the same time, there's concerns over privacy. So to play it safe, you might want to turn this setting off. There's also a setting that allows you to manually add a specific recording location if you need to, but from a search and discovery perspective, it's probably better to add any location as a hashtag in the video description. Automatic Concepts seems to suggest it will turn your video description into a mini Wikipedia, but again, I haven't seen it on YouTube, so I can't be sure. And it's experimental, so it might not last that long anyway. I think the point I'm ultimately getting to here is that anything that describes itself as automatic should be scrutinized long and hard before you leave it on. Because I guarantee you there are creators out there who have looked at their videos and said, why is this there? I didn't turn it on. And you probably did by accident or YouTube had this automatic setting on by default, which is really annoying. Here's a question you probably never thought to ask yourself. Should I allow my content to be freely used by any creator on YouTube? 
Well, there is a setting that will allow you to do this. To boil it down to its simplest explanation, the Creative Commons license allows anyone to use any part of your video without asking permission from you first. On the face of it, it sounds absolutely bonkers to give your content away for free for anybody to use. But the not unreasonable counter argument is that by doing this, you're potentially giving your content a much greater opportunity to be seen by a wider audience just not originally from your videos. Only you can decide whether or not it's worth switching to the setting, but there is a softer, lighter version of content sharing coming up now. It comes in the form of something called Shorts Remixing. This enables only YouTube Shorts creators to grab small snippets of audio or video from your content to use for their shorts. Beyond the fact that your content can only be used for shorts, the key difference here is that the Creative Commons license is kind of universal. Theoretically, somebody could download your entire video off of YouTube and use it for, say, Instagram or TikTok. With shorts remixing, everything is contained within the platform. Creators have to use YouTube tools to remix the content, and there are analytics set up in the YouTube studio to show you, the creator, how often your videos are remixed. Something to bear in mind is that the Creative Commons license setting is turned off by default, but the shorts remix setting is turned on by default. And this is probably something that you want to set at a upload default level so it affects all videos going forward. The comment settings, let's keep this nice and simple. Every creator should have at least basic moderation on. However, if you expect trolls and don't want them on your channel, or your content could be controversial, or you just don't want negativity floating around your video comments, then set this to strict. There's also a relatively new feature here, which is to pause comments. The benefit of this is that it keeps all existing comments on a video, but prevents users from posting new comments. And since we are on the topic of comments, now might be a good time to deviate into the channel settings and then go to community and scroll all the way down to the bottom of the automated filter screen to see V settings. What you see here are tons of emojis bad actors seem to use to spam our comments. But obviously you can use this box to write down all of the profanities and crude words you don't want to see in your comments. You're also likely going to need to block context specific words relevant to your niche. For us, it's stuff like sub for sub, audit my channel, give me a shout out. And of course, the ultimate spam killer, URL links. Nobody wants to see them in comments and handily, it doesn't block you from posting links in the comments of your own videos. Let's get back to YouTube settings now and ask the question of whether or not you should show viewers how many people have liked the video. Yes. Yes, you should. Now, I'm not sure you'd call this one a setting. It's more of a feature, but it is only available to YouTube Shorts creators and it's called Related Video. With this feature, you can directly link a YouTube Short to any of your other videos. When the short is being played, the link to that video will appear towards the bottom of the screen. Now, ideally, you want that short to be directly linked to the long form video in some way. And when we've tested it, we've got a click through rate of around about 10%, which is not bad. They're basically free views. All right, if we are starting to talk about features, Let's address the elephant in the room, video tags. This is what a YouTube employee had to say about them five years ago. We do look at tags a little bit, but not as much as creators think we do. I would strongly encourage everybody to spend, you know, 99% of their metadata time on the thumbnail, the title, little, you know, maybe half a percent on that description. Now in 2024, I'm tired of trying to convince creators not to stress about tags. So instead, I'm going to show you how to spend no more than 30 seconds on them. The title of this video is Growing on YouTube, right? So if we scroll down to the video tags, we can see that with the vidIQ browser extension installed, it's already suggesting relevant tags. So I can add a couple of these and then click refresh tags to get more specific and relevant tags until I've added what half a dozen or so of these and then add the channel name and that's it. Video tags job done in under 30 seconds. And if you want to be even more lazy, I mean efficient about video tags, just do a search on YouTube and copy the tags from a video and then remove the tags your video won't need. But again, I want to stress just like video categories, video tags will not define the success of your content on YouTube. However, something that could make a real difference to the success of your videos is A-B thumbnail testing, or what YouTube likes to call test and compare. With this settings slash feature, you can upload up to three thumbnails per video 
to find out which is the most attention grabbing. Whichever thumbnail has the best numbers after a test period, YouTube will use as your main thumbnail going forward. We here at vidIQ have been fortunate enough to be part of the beta test for this tool and it is awesome. But as time of recording, I know you only have one question. When are we all gonna get it? Our goal is to launch the feature to all creators by this summer. Why is it taking so long, you might ask? We've been listening to and iterating on feedback from our beta testers and want to make sure the feature is in the best shape possible for full launch. Oof. Few more months to brush up on your thumbnail skills then. All right, you lucky people who've made it this far, we've got one final bonus setting slash feature, and it's the only appropriate one we can show at this point in the video end screens. If a viewer gets to the end of one of your videos, there's a high chance you can push them to watch another one of your videos if you do it correctly. And this is how we do it. We pick one very intentional video that we're going to do a call to action to. And we know this works because end screens have generated half a million views for our channel over the last year. What you need to do is create a natural and logical link between the two videos and really sell the value of what the viewer can get if they continue to watch. For example, You've just watched an entire video about all of the settings that can make or break a video. But what about your channel? There are mission critical things you need to do at the very start of your YouTube journey. And this is where you'll find out how to do them. Did you see what I did there? <laughs> 